5.02. Early is on time and plenty of you were early this evening and we really appreciate it. We have people continuing to join, which is outstanding, but we're gonna get started on this fine Sunday evening. If you were fortunate to play games this weekend as players, congratulations on being able to do that. And uh, our talk this evening has a lot to do with that. We this evening are really um, excited, the Girls Academy to present to you college recruitment through the fall of 2020 and COVID. Uh, we know these are uh, crazy times out there um, and this league has, and I have to give kudos to our board of directors in giving, um, giving uh, us the opportunity to play this fall. I know many of you that were previously in the DA um, and even some of our new members were uh, scrambling back in the spring to even find a league to play in. And I wanna give kudos again to the group of people, many of our conference reps, the club academy directors and our board of directors uh, for getting the Girls Academy launched. And we're super excited about where we are right now and where we can go. Uh, my name is Leslie Gallimore. I'm the commissioner of the GA. And I'm excited this evening to present this to you with one of my dear, dear friends and a former colleague, Jackie Minarski. But before that, I want to get started with a little bit of a poll and figure out who of this great crowd we have here tonight we have. So if you've got your uh, finger near your mouse or your keyboard, go ahead and fill out this little poll and let us know who's here this evening. So if you're a high school graduate, parents, administrators, et cetera. All right, that's a good sampling right there. Got about 92% of you chiming in. I'll end the poll and share the results with you. We have uh, a few 21 grad high school graduates. Looks like the bulk of you are 22, 23. Some are younger than that. Uh, I hope you all have pencil and paper. Hopefully if you're younger than a 23 graduate, uh, a lot of this won't have to do with you by the time you're being recruited. Uh, parents are on, coaches are on. We have a few parents and players on the same Zoom. So outstanding. And again, I want to welcome you. Now I want to welcome our, it says that she, uh, I'm the moderator, but uh, I'm more just the introducer and I will have uh, some things to add in and chime in at the end. As some of you may know about me, I coached the division one college level for 24 years at the University of Washington. And uh, 34 years overall at the Division I level, uh, women's college soccer. So I know a teeny tiny bit about this, um, but from a compliance standpoint and everything that's going on now, uh, we couldn't be more pleased to have Jackie Minarski here with us this evening. Jackie is a former compliance uh, officer at the University of Washington, at the University of Portland. She's worked uh, as a conference rep in two different conferences across the country. She's now back living in New Haven, Connecticut, and um, I'm just really excited, Jackie, for you to join us, mostly because her biggest claim to fame is that she has sat in your shoes. She is a former Division I college soccer player at the University of Maryland, holds a lot of the records there still. Some of you may have read about Jackie. Um, so she knows what it's like to be you. So um, without further ado, Jackie, welcome, and thank you for taking your time this evening for the Girls Academy. Absolutely, very happy to be here and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to connect um, with you in this league. It's really phenomenal to see what um, is being created and um, a player centric league is, is, is phenomenal and, and I'm excited to, to be a small part of it. So let's get into it. And um, I was happy to see the, the demographic group and in that poll. And so I can uh, create some of my comments for that. But again, as Leslie mentioned, we are, are gonna talk about academic eligibility, a little bit about recruiting, 
uh, because that is an ever-changing landscape, especially in these times right now. Year-by-year -year reminders will likely be something that is um, the most helpful section of my presentation. And we're gonna cut back to Leslie, to, um, who did phenomenal work in getting college coaches to answer questions. Um, that must have been, uh, I don't know how you got them to do that, but uh, the response rate on that was amazing. And um, throughout this whole thing, I just wanna remind people that, that your recruiting is, is up to you and how you're gonna get recruited that this is your process. This isn't just something that happens, that you can control this and that this is a process that you have way more control over than, than, than you might currently believe that you do. So, so keep that in mind as we, we move forward for tonight. Again, the landscape is, and the admissions process. This is something that we're going to talk about throughout the night, that, that your, your college eligibility, your recruiting, and then the college admissions component of this are all three different components uh, that you have to manage during this time. Um, but as with everything with COVID, it is changing daily. So when we start talking about test scores in, in, in pre-COVID world, test scores were super important. Right now, I think there's many colleges uh, that are not requiring the um, SAT, ACT. The NCAA will not be, and we'll get more into that. But when we talk about stuff that's changing and fluid, this is good practice for life that uh, go with the flow here. Um, you're recruiting um, your 21s and 22s. You, you're gonna have to, to navigate this a little bit. So I'm really glad you're here and we can, we can talk about some strategies on that. The general NCAA requirements right now, it might seem silly, but you've got to graduate in four years with your, your regular class. So from the start of ninth grade to the fourth year, um, we know that lots of um, young folks do things like running start and junior college. So you might graduate early, that's going to be okay. Um, but staying on time to graduate with your class is, is one of the main staples of NCAA um, eligibility. Um, also, this is for division one, generally, uh, for 16 core courses. Every high school's got core courses. So those are your math sciences and um, general ed sessions like um, social studies and foreign language um, that, are, that are certified by the NCAA as academic credit. Each high school has a list we um, encourage you to talk with your guidance counselor to get that list. You can also Google your high school list um, as well. It's a publicly available. And if you just put NCAA Eligibility Center High School Core Course, it'll come right up, the portal that you can enter your high school. And again, you'll see the stars on the ACT summary, uh, sum score and combined score. Um, all the test scores are asterisk right now because the NCAA for uh, 2021s um, are not required right now. 22s, we don't know. Um, but 2021s, the, the NCAA, your eligibility will not use a test score. If you have one on record and it's beneficial to you, they will use it. Um, but it is not going to be a requirement. It is a 16 core um, and graduating with your high school also with the two, three minimum GPA for competition and eligibility. Um, but I do believe in this um, for the next year that NCAA eligibility will allow waivers and different circumstances to um, accommodate any kind of e-learning and other kind of um, situations that you might be enduring because of your high school. Um, NCAA, again, requirements for division one, four years of English, always four years of English. Um, your high school, there's some places in the US that do not require four years of English. Um, please take four years of English. And that usually is, again, when you go to your core courses um, from your high school, you can pull up what is considered an English course. Sometimes some writing courses are not considered English, um, like a creative writing course or a poetry class maybe because the NCAA, they haven't, your high school hasn't sent that information to the NCAA. Um, easily done for your high school to do that, but uh, let's just make sure you're on the front foot and making sure that your eligibility, that's one that's kind of sneaky, um, four years of English, three years of math, that small print says algebra or higher, 
Um, natural physical science, you got to get one of those lab sciences in, and those are fun. Um, and then another year of an additional English, math, or physical science. Um, so you can choose your own adventure there. Social sciences, get some government classes in, that's a really good um, right now. Um, get some civics, and then some additional core courses in terms of those in that small print, foreign language, um, philosophy, for um classes for you all of you out there who might be at a um, religious based school uh sometimes religion does not count that is something to definitely check in on um to make sure that your high school had that religion classes sometimes do not count um if your high school does not have a lot of core courses there are some online um, places like the bu online um and other um there's an Osborne online high school in Florida that um, is reasonably priced and the NCAA takes their courses um, if you find yourself short on core courses um, through your high school. Um, and again, 10 core courses by the time you're in your seventh semester. If you are generally progressing through your high school, then you are, you're doing your, your part. Uh, on the note on the left side of it, a full qualifier, that is your goal. That allows you to play immediately um, coach's discretion, um, allows you to get aid. Um, and then as a full qualifier, that is, um, a great status to have, um, an academic red shirt. You can only practice and you can get aid, but you cannot compete. Um, that academic red shirt is if your high school GPA is below a two, three. Great. Leslie. Yeah, oh, two. Oh, it popped up. It did change. Okay. So division two. Um, so you've got your three years. They take away one of the three years of English, but have an additional core. Again, um, the NCAA two requirements, just a little different um, in that they only have full qualifiers and partial qualifiers. Um, they don't have a, the academic redshirt option. Um, there's not a slide for it, but division three is be generally admitted as a student athlete. So the, uh, for Division Three being admitted to a Division Three institution, you are automatically eligible in that regard. Um, NAIA um, is um, has their own eligibility center, if you can believe it. Um, their requirements, uh, it's I don't know what they're doing. I uh, I'll have full full disclosure, um, but previously that it was a combination of having a a minimum test score, GPA, and graduating in the top half of your class, you had to have two or three of those um, of those scenarios happen. Um, in terms of core courses, AP classes, um, running start classes, 99.9% um, .9 chance of the time, AP classes are gonna be approved. Those are like the highest level A, um, courses. I will also say, if you can get college credit, for your AP classes, go for it. And if you're taking um, junior college classes um, as, part to, as part of your high school, make sure you get those transcripts, make sure you send those in. Um, one, it's a great way to save your, your family money to get some of those core courses taken care of in college. Um, it gives you more options as you move through your four years. Um, but those are, those are really good strategies to um, allow, uh, I, I got to keep coming my AP classes and then I got to take some fun electives um, at Maryland. So um, a forensics class, which was a lot of fun. Um, that wasn't part of my major, but I just needed uh, classes. So um, they can open up options for you when you uh, move forward, but those are good questions. Thank you. Key takeaways, right? The requirements for your NCAA eligibility will likely differ from admissions, right? So there's lots of different kinds of admissions. There's holistic admissions, there's straight bylaws admission, um, not bylaw admission, um, straight GPA and core. But right now admission standards are, are very much changing. And yes, even as a student athlete, you have to apply to college. Um, I, I get that question every year. Um, an example I would use, is that the University of Washington, they require two years of foreign language. That is not an NCAA requirement, but that is a university admissions requirement. Um, also, some universities still require the writing portion of the SAT. So please know that like the colleges that you're interested in is admission wise and that your NCAA eligibility are two separate things. 
Um, also, the NCAA allows for super scoring. Um, for those that um, know that term, it's your best scores. If you take it twice, your best um, English and your best math. Um, some universities do not require this. Um, as a 2021, you're likely not going to have to do that based on COVID. Um, 22s, this exception might not extend to you right now. So just stay tuned, be prepared. The other thing that is still unknown is if test scores are going to be used for some institutional financial aid. Um, so if there is an opportunity for you to take it safely or, um, or if there's a place that a college that you know that you're applying to that is going to use it, it might be worth it um, in terms of test scores um, if they're using for financial aid. My guess is um, that will likely be few and far between. Um, and again, sending transcripts is super easy. In, get, if you don't know your guidance counselor, go um, and introduce yourself on Zoom or if you have the privilege of going to class um, in person right now, um, please go say hello to your guidance counselor. They can help upload transcripts to the eligibility center. They can help upload transcripts to the colleges that you are interested into. The other note at the bottom is um, like most people in my profession, um, college compliance folks are super useful and super helpful. The also bonus of that is as you talk about recruiting rules, recruiting rules don't apply to um, college compliance folks. So your local friendly compliance officer is usually available for you to answer questions um, to help navigate this problem. Um, not problem. <laughs> um, these, if you have problems with your, your transcripts or, or concerns about whether you're eligible or not, um, your local friendly compliance office, um, go to the biggest university that's um, in your area um, and they will be an expert on your local high schools is my guess. Great. So, right, with all the craziness and chaos that's going on, what if you don't meet the NCAA requirements? What if you don't get a scholarship to the right place? Or a coach tells you, hey, I'm not going to have a scholarship um, at the fall, in fall, but mid-year some money is going to open up. Right now, scholarship math is going to be crazy, and we'll get more into that later. But with how eligibility is going, with how seasons are spring, fall, school are playing um, all throughout this year, it is going to be um, very difficult for coaches to manage your rosters. And thus, that means managing their financial aid and their scholarship totals available. So you might be told that you can come, but we might not have money for you until a future semester. If that doesn't work for you, maybe um, possibly a junior college or right now with, with COVID, there might be family reasons and, and vital reasons that a four-year college does not work for you right now. So what can you do? Consider attending junior college. Again, financially, this is usually a really good option and there are many reasons to choose a, a junior college. Junior col qualifiers do go to junior college. I, 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 I get this all the time, but if I go to junior college, coaches won't think my academics are good. No, um, junior colleges are great places um, to get uh, some of those uh, first year uh, core classes done in a very inexpensive and um, very pocketbook friendly um, manner. For non-qualifiers, if you, if you do happen to go to a junior college, um, you cannot enroll full time. So, um, Take one or two classes, do not enroll full time, um, and make sure they're classes that would um, transfer. To, if you know the four year college that you might be going to, so just say you're going to do this in the fall next year, and then you're going to enroll mid year, be in contact with the compliance officer and your and that in your future coach at that college, and make sure those college transfer credits are going to be accepted by your future four year college. Um, really staying with this uh, straightforward like 101 classes and math and standard sciences are going to usually be good bets for most places. Again, you also have to do well in those classes for them to transfer. Um, so two fives to be eligible for competition and practice. If you have a, a junior college transfer GPA of below 2.5, um, you'll have to be, um, you'll be eligible for aid and practice only, no competition. But again, please don't rule out junior college um, transfers. 
that in this time it's a it's a viable option. All right, so we're gonna get, so I'm actually, I'm in New Haven, so I'm pretty close to New York. So I'm gonna get the little bit of the direct conversation East Coasty part of my personality out. Um, so <laughs> I'm sitting here um, uh, again in Connecticut and, and joining you here. So what if college, if at all, again, if it's appropriate for you right now to go to college, um, in talking with so many folks, matriculation is not going to be like in this time um, is going to be something that that there's going to be a lot of patience and waivers for you right now. But what I want you all to, to think about is the appropriate level and experience for you. What does that look like academically? What does that look like financially? Are you willing to take on some debt? Um, Type and size of college, a very big difference between a private institution, a small private institution versus a big state school. Um, my experience at Maryland, I was in a class of 300 for most of my first two years. That was very okay for me. Um, I, that was some way I could learn. I had a small uh, uh, side class. You go to lecture at 300 people. You had a, a teaching section and then that really, my first core classes were all that way. Um, a place like Portland, no more than 20, 30 people in a, in a class. So again, if, if you need to know your learning style, you need to know if that's gonna be okay, if you're just gonna be a number in some classes and not know your professors possibly. Um, what does it also mean to be socially, emotionally at these, at these colleges? Far, close, close to home. Can you travel home? Um, does a program allow, is being in a sorority something important to you um, and and those kind of social engagements if you're the editor of your newspaper you're going to be able to do that balance both um, and then only then you should be considering the athletic component of it so again this is um the college recruiting rules are changing in the favor that these are conversations and thoughts that you can have more time to figure out now that recruiting is being delayed Jackie, uh, I just wanted to see yep. your thoughts about uh, Division Three, and I know there's questions <laughs> um, coming up later on yep. about Ivy League schools as well, which yep. Ivies are non-scholarship, <laughs> but Division yep. One and then Division Three schools are non-scholarship academic uh, and then need-based financial aid and uh, academic-based financial aid. You want to mm -hmm. touch on those a little bit? Yeah. Oh, you you basically covered. So Ivies, um, there's they're not athletic scholarships, but there's endowments and packages that can be created for, for various student athletes and of exceptional qualities and skills that, that those folks think. Um, in terms of financial aid for division two and three, you will find that their institutional aid packages can mirror or even better athletic scholarships because they're unlimited, they're institutional. Um, they might have an endowment that you happen to click off the boxes for that. Um, and, and that can be, you know, endowments at private schools are, are funny things. There was one at, when I was at Portland, it was a, a student athlete who, who either played golf or volleyball and was from a certain um, county in Oregon. And it was like, okay, I have one of those this year, here's some aid. And so it was, um, there can be some in very interesting financial aid packages that could be as um, balanced as uh, equal when you come down to it as a, as a division one scholarship. So um, that's also why to keep academics going because they're usually academic nexus um, and the like. And the IVs um, have certain academic requirements. It's called your, your IVAI your admissions index. And so um, individuals there um, can sometimes get tripped up um, with poor grades in the end um, and possibly lose options to get institutional financial aid at IVs. Is that responsive? Yeah, and I would also add that uh, outside of the NC2A divisions one, two, and three and the junior college route to obviously gain credits um, uh, if, if you're a non-qualifier, which doesn't happen in girls and women's soccer too often. It's just a, a way to, to get credits and, and maybe uh, take some time before going again during COVID, 
you know, when you decide to matriculate. The, the other option are NAIA schools, which is outside of the NC2A rules. They have their own set of rules, which I would say are much more lax and lenient than the NC2A rules. Uh, and I, I do think that, that players and parents, we talk about all these divisions, you know, the uh, division one, which is where I coached and where Jackie played and um, is, is tends to be the, the division that everyone talks about the most and being the most competitive. If you start to look around the women's game now, and I won't get too soapboxy about this, but um, professional players are coming from all ranks of college soccer now. Um, here on the OL Reign, for instance, I know I tweet about her a lot because I've, I've just been in awe of her and she's in national team camp starting tomorrow is Bethany Balser, who uh, attended an NAI school and was rookie of the year, her first season um, in the NWSL. So there are a lot of um, small colleges in the NAI. Um, there, there's not necessarily an age limit. So you'll play at times with older players. Uh, they do have scholarships. Uh, some of them are religious schools, some are not, some are private, some are public, but it's just a different division to consider. Mm -hmm. So um, the NAI is something that, that definitely is worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and just to plug that as well, um, my sister, who's a fairly decent athlete, she got to play soccer and tennis at her division three school um, and be in a sorority. So when we talk about, and those were important things for her. Um, so again, her experience looked very different than, than mine as a division one player with a year round commitment um, in that regard. The scholarship math, I know the parents on board are like, let's talk about the math for scholarships. For women's soccer in division one, there's only 14 per team, entirely 14 per team. Um, these scholarships can be divided up um, from anything from 1% to 99% to 100%. Um, when you're looking at rosters, um, if you're trying to figure out who's on Scott Lake, how they award their aid and scholarship, international students, if there's a high population of international students on a roster, they're likely at 100% based on um, various other um, sponsorship and immigration rules. So um, again, so if if you're trying to see, hey, do you think they have money for me? And we'll talk about that, navigating that conversation a little bit later. Um, just be aware that international students usually are a full one scholarship. When we look at, it's amazing to me that there's 333 teams in NCAA Division One. I. I think it was just over 100 um, when my dinosaur um, <laughs> eligibility was, uh, was there. Um, and we were not at 14. And so again, that's that when you look at that number, while we put that out there out front, that about 4,600 scholarships for really 9,500 players. And so if this is how, like, if, if you're thinking that the end all be is a division one full scholarship for four years, the math is not on your side. And so I, I just want, um, that reality to, to just be in some family thoughts right now in terms of how aid is awarded. Um, aid is awarded now also in um, not in one year uh, awards anymore that they can be multi-year awards. So when you when and if you are blessed with an offer, um, you have to um, you have to um, I have to do something real quick. Sorry, an animal. Um, the animal. Um, also, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a zoom call without one? And so, um, okay. When you get back in this, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a, where was I in my speech, Leslie? Animals, the math. Math. Oh, I'm um, going to actually, I'm going to actually chime in oh, and let, let you get back yeah. on track because you said we'll okay. navigate it a little bit later. And I know in recruiting discussions when student, uh, when uh, prospective student athletes are talking to coaches, sometimes it's, it, it can be an uncomfortable conversation. And especially for the, the student athlete who may be not paying out of their own pocket, it's probably a family decision with their parents. Uh, so my approach and every, every college coach is going to be different, but my approach is that that's a, a family discussion. And sometimes even without the student athletes, because sometimes parents are more comfortable just having that with the coach and without the, the prospective student athlete or the recruit there. Um, a lot of times we get questions, should we just tell them up front, I don't need money, I'll come no matter what. 
Um, division one and division two athletic scholarships are talent based. And so if you've earned a scholarship, um, it, it shouldn't really matter if your family is fortunate enough to not have to base your decision on the financial piece, then um, kudos to you and, and, and you should feel fortunate, but it doesn't mean that it should take away from the fact that your, your talent has earned you a scholarship. Um, but if you, if, if at the end of the day in the recruitment process or somewhere during it, it starts to feel as though um, the scholarship may be an issue for the coach. You, that's something that you come to um, in, in two-way conversation is like, that's not going to be the basis of my decision is usually what a player will say if, if it's not going to, you know, make, make that determination. So um, I, I think that kind of addresses that question. Um, there are some families that come straight out and say, we don't need a scholarship where this is, you know, this is going to be 100% a decision based on where she wants to go, where, you know, our recruit um, decides is the best fit for her. Um, and that, Obviously, if, if you want to share that piece of information, then that will help that coach uh, make a decision on their roster spot for you. Um, but that's a, again, that's one that's just kind of on a case by case basis. Yeah. Thank you in the chat for Ryan. I was on multi year aids <laughs> agreement. So let's go back because there's a, there's a part about this I want to make sure that, that folks are informed about how multi year aid agreements can be written and can be. Um, slightly written and, and possibly um, uh, not as, as straightforward as some folks would like them to be. So when you're, when you're looking at financial aid agreements and if you're blessed enough to, to receive an offer of aid, um, be clear that coaches with like that, if they're speaking about percentages of tuition or, or what components they're going to cover um, or if, they're, if it's um, a straight dollar amount because as we all know, college gets more and more expensive every year. So if you're on a 10% scholarship in year one and it's 10% it's in year one and 10% in year two, it's actually almost a reduction if the college tuition goes up. Um, so sometimes it's, it's perhaps better for finances to ask college coaches that, that either be in dollar amounts or that, um, or in component base. So it's like that, uh, that the college will do all the tuition regardless of the cost, room and board. Um, and those things look different if individuals move off campus, um, in, which is very common in sophomore, junior year, um, as opposed to being in dorms. So again, when you're, when you're, if you're having those conversations, what do those things look like? And also then possibly, and something that is, was super common, um, when I was on campus, it was aid agreements being progressive throughout your career so that the aid might not be available now, but as um, aid becomes available for juniors and senior years, that those things can, um, can occur. Um, and scholarships can be increased, not decreased um, throughout your four-year tenure. So again, the scholarship- I'm gonna say that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> that last um, bit. Yeah, scholarships should not be, um, taken away for, um, for reasons. Um, I'm, uh, it happens, um, but I, I, if, it, if you're ever in that situation, really be in touch with your compliance officer um, on campus because um, if you've signed an aid agreement, your aid cannot be reduced from that. Um, you should um, uh, just know that that's part of the agreement that you, you've made. All right, scholarship math. Right now, recruiting, it's a dead period. And, and there's like quiet and all these other periods for the NCAA. But right now the NCAA has taken coaches off the road, no in-person contact um, at all, um, on campus, off campus at all. It's a completely dead period. So D1. right now, D1. Um, so this is, um, right now, let's just can't attend games, no unofficial or official visits. I'm sorry for you seniors and, and juniors in the world. That's, that's a really cool component and really um, uh, previously important part of, um, uh, of looking at schools and getting a feel for them. Uh, but hopefully we can come up with some ways in the next uh, few months and that we can get those things back. But right now um, that is a, an in-person dead period by the NCAA and that's across all sports that's just not women's soccer yeah you might see some coaches from other divisions out at your games and that's because mm -hmm. they are not d1 coaches 
if the D1 coaches and they're wearing U.S. soccer scouting gear and you notice, recognize them as a college coach, that's, that's what they're doing. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, so what is permissible, right? So you're going to hear me say a lot, be patient. This is, again, this is a unique year. Um, be patient with yourself. Be patient with college coaches. Um, and right now you are doing, you are making it happen in terms of figuring out what is the best part about how you're going to make, how you are going to do and play college soccer. So thank you for being here. Um, but again, take care of yourself mentally, physically, emotionally. This is a trying time um, for everyone. This is the way from possibly friends not playing games, maybe playing a game or intermittently, like it just really do the things and learn about yourself, what you need to be mentally and physically, emotionally prepared for stuff. Um, as you move through this, this is, this is good life lessons, but um, yeah, that it'll serve you well. And then we're gonna just talk about virtually recruiting right now. During your freshman and sophomore year, there are, there are literally no permissible recruiting activities. College coaches should not be contacting you directly. College coaches can talk to your club coaches, but they should not be facilitating direct communication with you. They should not be handing you a phone. They should not be saying um, things directly to you. Now your club coaches out there, I know you wanna be like, hey, this college coach is interesting. Great, like we can't police that conversation, but that phone should not be handed to any freshman or sophomore. Please like let the recruiting rules happen in this way. This is a positive step for college recruiting. Most sports are starting to get this way. Um, also for the families in the room, if you've had older siblings, these are newer rules. They might've had a very different experience. Um, the feedback that um, the NCAA got from current college students was they didn't, that what the, I can't even do the math, that the current like seniors in college had horrible recruiting experiences because they were committing as freshmen. And so the NCAA took that feedback and made these new rules to allow um, players to commit and make the college process realign with their peers. And so to me, um, and I think most college coaches, this is a super positive um, new rule. Uh, on campus, there were many times where I had unofficial visitors who were freshmen who, who didn't know what major they wanted. We couldn't look at their transcripts. Um, and so that those were, those were way too deep conversations and, and life choices to be made at 14 and 15. So um, these things, what we want you to be doing your freshman and during your sophomore year, Um, is start your process and start figuring out, remember those questions from the beginning. What do you want out of your college experience? Do you want a larger urban or small school, urban or rural? Again, so some of my decision points were I had some family situations that I needed to be within four or five hours, an easy train ride to get back home to New York. Maryland fit that perfectly for me. Um, it was competitively great. I wanted a massive school. I went to a very small high school. So having lots of people around at a, at a big place um, was, was amazing. Those are some of the things that you can start figuring out about yourself. Um, please start researching made, like majors of things you might be interested in. Not saying you need to make a career choice right now at 15, um, but be aware of majors. If you are already passionate, this is my favorite go-to example. Um, if you want to be a vet, like a big animal vet, you're looking at Tennessee, Texas A&M, Maryland, yay. Um, so big, they have big vet schools, big animal vet schools. Um, don't be looking at the University of Washington. There's not a vet program there. Um, so like things like that. Uh, if you're into nursing, there are very specific schools that are good at doing nursing. There are, there, it's also very hard to be a student athlete. We'll just be confident, it'll just be upfront. If nursing is a passion, you have to vet that with your college coaches and during your recruiting process. Um, but again, those are things that it, if athletic training is not always at all colleges. Um, and then what does that look like, especially pre-med? Um, and again, I stress it enough, 
there's so much soccer on TV. It's such a fun time to be um, a soccer fan and a women's soccer fan that there's so many games. So start watching stream games um, at the college level, um, professional level, but most importantly at the college level. So you can get an idea about coaching style, what how conferences play. Um, you know the. Uh, time when I was at the ACC, Maryland was in the ACC. So again, I'll date myself there. Um, very possession oriented league. Um, probably would have been better suited at a Big Ten school, uh, to be honest, but um, a little bit more direct. They, um, but that was then. But again, watching stream games and seeing how teams play. Can you see yourself? You know, you like your, your level. Can you see yourself playing and competing on that same field? What does it look like for you? So those are things that you can start doing and being getting yourself into the process. And if you want to be doing something during that time, these are good things to be doing during your freshman and, and sophomore year. That's great, Jackie. I was just going to um, chime in on this a little bit because we've heard from, I've heard from a lot of different college coaches uh, that one of the things, and, and I'll get to it a little bit later, but while you were here, I wanted to, to mention it is that, it, it, and it's a COVID specific uh, thing is when, mm -hmm. when you are looking at schools, uh, coaches right now, especially for whatever reason, um, the close to home or away from home has become a thing. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, you know, in the last decade or more of college soccer, kids were willing to pick up and go across the country and, um, not just play sort of in their area or in their region. Not that, not that some recruits aren't now looking all over the country, but I think there are many families and many players who have become a little bit more um, apt to want to stay locally. And it's just something that, that uh, college coaches want to know up front. So if it's something in your profile uh, that you have on your, your little soccer resume or something that you're emailing them, um, clearly, if you're looking at a school, you're, you're from the West Coast and you're looking at a school on the East Coast, um, you're not going to say, I'd rather stay close to home. They'll just stop recruiting you. But if, if you put in your profile that I, I want to stay in California, for in instance, or I want to stay on the West Coast, or that's just really helpful to the college coaches so they can sort of decipher um, and filter through, you know, all the numerous players that they're looking at, and it gives you a better chance of finding the place you want to go. So that piece of information is not one that recruits have typically shared early on, um, or even like, you know, as they get towards the, the, the meat of their search, but it's really important that um, something like that, if it's meaningful to you, that you share it with college coaches, so you're not wasting their time and coaches get more excited if they know they have a chance at you if you want to go far away or stay close to home and stay regionally. But that's become a little bit more of a, a COVID question is that, you know, I think traveling has become so much more regionalized that um, kids are staying closer to home, coaches are finding, especially this year. And so for the next couple of years, that might be similar. So be thinking about that and sharing it with coaches. Okay, first day, June 15th after your sophomore year. Um, this might not, depending on how your school schedule is, this might not be after your sophomore year, but it's like the June 15th at the end of your sophomore year um, is the first day of permissible recruiting. The first permissible recruiting activities, direct text messaging to you. Uh, telephone calls, virtual calls, Zoom, these kind of interactions, um, FaceTime, like all count as telephone calls ish, I guess we call them. Um, just direct communication with you can start on June 15th. Um, you can also get items in the mail that are personalized to you. Uh, possibly before this point, you got camp brochures and then just maybe a generic uh, letter about camps. Um, but now coaches can start sending direct mailers to you as well on June 15th. As Leslie was saying, be prepared for this day. This is this is like the day that that you can you can start being really prepared for and get um, on the front foot with colleges. The whole idea is to make it really easy for you to be recruited. So these are things that um, are can help that. Be ready with an electronic copy of your academic transcript. So as you can start with the direct messaging. Um, being able to send an academic transcript to a coach immediately, 
they will help you know whether you're on track to be admissible to their university. Um, do not believe in this fallacy that every um, athlete gets into any college they want. Um, that is, that is, it happens. It's very rare for women's soccer. Um, create a generic profile, not a generic, your personal profile, your general profile about some of the things that Leslie was saying. To make it easy, right, in these conversations, um, have things that make it easy for you to be recruitable. A picture, great. Eligibility summer, some number, because we're going to tell you that in your sophomore year, you should be registered with the eligibility center by this point and have some um, academic information up and in there as well. Your contact information. Don't assume coaches have this. What is the best um, number and how do you want to be recruited? Um, for, for me, uh, Sunday nights were always family time. There, there was not going to be not taking calls from recruiters on Sunday nights during Sunday dinner. Um, this is where I want you to feel empowered about your recruiting. Don't think if you, as a parent and as, as players out there, um, please um, feel free about, like, if you don't want text messages during the day, during um, or your Zoom schools, um, so, or text messages, or direct messaging, no direct messaging, or text messaging, or it's through a particular app that you would choose to use as a family. Those are things that you can have control over um, and help coaches navigate what is appropriate for you to be recruited. Um, also add in some fun facts, like maybe that you have a cat that jumps into your Zoom calls. Um, that was Tug on my end. And give coaches something to talk with you about. Like sometimes it can be a little awkward, any kind of stuff that you can start conversations about um, possibly your desired major or your favorite class. Um, also, I put in family information in this as well. Um, coming from someone who had a, a, a tough family situation in terms of um, like my mom had passed by the before I was starting to recruit. Um, I actually had a college coach ask me like, when can I talk to your mom? And so like having some family information of stuff that might be awkward for you to disclose, but just having like a sentence on there can help you avoid possibly some difficult conversations. Um, if you're with an aunt or uncle or a, a guardian or individuals um, who are your caretakers, your grandparents, and those are the people that you want in your recruiting, just have a nice, just a sentence on there and, and avoid those tough conversations um, for you. And again, those are things when we talk about being prepared mentally, emotionally, and physically. Um, that's a little thing that you can do to help yourself navigate some of those conversations. Um, don't assume the college coaches know when you are going to be playing with your team. Um, you may be on a family vacation. Um, so when do you have a tournament schedule that you are planning on attending? Um, and again, if you, when and if we do go back to COVID, pre-COVID world where you're taking ACTs and SATs, um, let coaches know when you're going to take those things. This is also between this June 15th and our next date, way too early to even have the conversation about scholarships. Way too early. Do not, do not have the first few conversations with college coaches involve money. It's just, it's, they don't know at this time um, and it, what I've heard and experienced from college coaches, it's just too soon. Um, and they wanna get a feel for who you are, um, what you're about and before even that conversation can be broached at this point. So these are just little things that you can get done. Um, also little side note, like commit to a Jersey number so that again, that, that they can consistently see you in a Jersey. Um, if you happen to be guest playing or playing with other teams, just make sure you get your Jersey number to coaches the color you're playing in, especially in video world. Um, make sure that those things are clear um, and that you're clearly identifiable in those in videos. And when you do start getting back into in-person play. There's a couple of questions coming up. I know. Yeah. Lucy, thank you. She's answering some of them in the chat. I can't open my question and answer box, so I don't see what's coming in right <laughs> now. But um, 
I do know there's a couple of things just on this topic, mm -hmm. Jackie, that yeah. um, have been asked and, and what happens when you're promised a roster spot, but you don't get into school. This would be the A1 number, you know, number one yeah. <laughs> top of the list reason not to pigeonhole yourself too early and to make sure that you have options, particularly if you know what the academic requirements are for one school. If you've asked the question of the college coach, uh, what their odds are, because some schools can help you with admissions, some schools can't. Knowing that up front is really, really important if they can help you with the admissions piece if you're a borderline regular admit. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Ivies and some Division three schools too, uh, if, if you're trending the wrong way, they have, you know, a difficult time at times telling you too early if they can admit you or not, or they only have so many slots. So um, if you're applying to a high, high-end academic school where the admission standards are extremely high, just make sure you ask all the questions and have a backup because you don't want to get stuck in that kind of situation. Um, some, somebody's also asked about paying for recruiting services. And again, um, in your clubs within the GA and you know, your, your clubs will have um, some type of uh, recruiting you know, support that they, that they give you. And especially when you start to get to the recruitable age, um, that's a personal choice. If you wanna spend more money on a recruiting service, uh, I would just be sure that it's reputable and you know what you're getting from them and that you feel as though it's something you're not already getting in your club and in your club environment. Um, and that, again, that would be a, a personal a personal choice. There are some of those that seem almost, if emails are coming from them and not from you, mm -hmm. may seem very generic and you'll get lost in the shuffle or lost in junk mail. You have to also be proactive yourself if you're using one of those. Um, I think there is more and more, especially through COVID, um, there are more and more apps coming through that are easier to use on site that, um, that some uh, college coaches and recruits are using that help connect both as far as who's watched me and um, you know, what they thought and they're able to rate them and things like that. So there's, there's different things coming out that may be worth your while. Um, I don't think it's 100% a necessity, but it is definitely a, a personal choice. Um, mm -hmm. Someone else asked the question about, um, uh, what was that other question someone asked that was about, um, if they can't help you get in academically, but they've promised you a roster spot as a walk-on. Um, mm -hmm. That one's a little bit tough. If, if, if you know you can get in there academically and they've promised you a roster spot as a walk-on um, and there's nothing you're going to sign that commits you to them or legally binds you to them like an NLI, which doesn't happen until very late in the game um, and doesn't happen at every division, is that's a, that, that's, that's a sort of a, <laughs> hopefully everyone operates in good faith and you have a really good relationship with this school and this coach and that roster spot's gonna be something that's guaranteed to you. Um, I, I would say that most of the time that would be the case because most college coaches are extremely reputable. And, but the other issue is whether they're repu reputable or not, sometimes roster size changes, mm -hmm. uh, positions change, the transfer uh, portal opens and they find a player in a position that maybe only has two years of eligibility. So they don't need a four year person in your position. So it really, really behooves you to make sure if that's the case, um, that if you're going to walk on to that school and are guaranteed, you know, or you're a recruited walk on that it's going to be guaranteed a spot that uh, you feel very comfortable about that promise. And you also feel comfortable that that coach by the time you get there is still going to be there because a new coach will not be bound to you. So it's risky on your part. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. It is. And, and I would say in COVID times with the way rosters are going to be over the next couple of years, um, there's going to be a lot of kids that are, uh, maybe the money isn't there. So again, it just behooves the really honest conversation with the coach, because, um, I, I think money is going to be an issue. The, the, the math is going to be difficult as players get fifth years and, um, people are coming back that they thought were leaving and there's all kinds of things. So you just have to ask the question and hope for honesty in return. But sometimes that's it, right? Knowing the question to ask. Ask about roster spots. Ask about if scholarship money is freeing up. If there's no scholarship money available and you need it, um, is it because they have so many returners? Just engage in the conversation when it comes to that point. Um, yeah, so, and again, just checking for understanding, be prepared for this day. June 15th is the day Jackie was talking about. Absolutely. Um, my two cents about recruiting services, I think that's too far, is it? Oh, oh. nope. Nope, all right. Um, recruiting services, 
I am of the opinion that 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 you should be the the driver of your own ship. Um, and there there's nothing that you can't do or access that recruiting folks can't you can't do on your own uh, with a little bit of legwork. Um, and I think part of that research um, in and of itself is, is good for for all of you out there. So keys to getting recruited. Um, this is something I've actually stole from a former football coach um, who would use this and uh, I really love it. So some of the like little indicators that coaches know throughout my, my experience have used is if you're a good student, you don't have to be outstanding. You don't have to be like the like A plus student, good students, solid students who are consistently showing up. Um, I don't know if you realize that on your uh, transcripts, there's usually an attendance box, how many times you're there at school. Some of those things, those are little key indicators, means a house in order. Um, that means you're easily recruited. Remember, coaches are in this profession um, because they love it, but they also, as players, as you as players, will be part of um, their uh, hireability and uh, whether they will um, continue to work. So they want to make sure that they're getting someone who is going to be responsive on all fronts, academically, athletically, you're being evaluated at all points. Um, so academics is something that, again, you want to make it easy for you to be recruited. Keep your academics in order. Character, right? Failure happens to everyone. How do you handle it? Um, I've had coaches, I had one coach come and there was a, a great recruit. I was doing some work on their file, comes in, oh, stop working on it, went, um, they got a, a yellow card for yelling at a referee. No, some, there's some coaches that just won't take that. So again, um, or yelled at their coach when they were getting subbed. That was another one. I was like, wow, okay. Um, or came off the bench and kicked a, a water cooler off. Those things, like, our character things that, you know, uh, if you're, you're awesome and you're, you're, I don't know, like some coaches are willing to handle that more coaches in my experience, that there are so many other players that will be like, um, that will come off the field and listen to the coach, what they have to say, um, and then go and cheer their teammates on. So being a good teammate, being a good, um, being a good character um, and show that you're going to be a team player. Social media every year. Every year um, I've had coaches drop uh, uh, recruits because they posted something on their social media. Um, don't think every private C setting isn't um, set in stone. Um, you can have your friend of a friend like a picture or send a picture to a coach or just it tagged in other ways. There's just lots of various different ways that social media can turn around and, and, and be a complete negative for you. Make it a positive and accurate representation of yourself. Um, because again, you when you go to a college, especially at the division one, you are a brand ambassador for that university. You are a high profile. You will be on Twitter. You will be on social media. In the Pac-12, you're on the Pac-12 network, SEC network, you're on, you're on TV. You're on like, those are things and the university is going to want you to be a positive um, present also, in the world where the where you might likely, if you're a Division One athlete, get your name, image, and likeness to be your own, start thinking about yourself as an influencer and what does your social media presence look like. Athletics team leader that doesn't always mean captain. Um, you don't always have to have the armband to to be a positive influence and be a great teammate. Um, what are your coaches saying about you? College coaches are talking to your current club coaches. What are they saying about you? Um, are you in the practice? Are you someone who gets on your phone immediately after practice? Do you stay a little bit late? Do you come a little bit early? Um, what is what does that look like? Passion for the sport. Are you watching the, um, the NWSL? Um, I had my, my good friend, she plays, uh, she coaches basketball, um, but she uh, retold a story to me recently where she was recruiting uh, a young woman who she thought was like she was going to be really into um, started the conversations and then asked her what her like had like watching the WNBA and have you been watching like the bubble like what do you think about that and she's like eh. the recruit was like eh, I don't know hmm. I don't I don't I only watch the NBA like she she said she wanted to throw the phone. Um, she ended the conversation lightly, but then that was uh, was likely not going to continue to recruit that that individual because there is a passion and a and a 
and some kind of underlying um, commitment that you need to fuel the fire and, and be part of your sport and know that this is such a, an amazing thing um, where women's sports is at this fantastic point. I mean, again, desire to win. Are you still playing when you're, you're three down um, or are you having a pity party um, on, the, on the pitch? So again, um, those are character moments. And again, things that coaches can look for um, that aren't, aren't goals, aren't minutes played, aren't little things that you can are completely and 100% in your control. August 1st, junior year, open recruiting. I think that's the best way to say it. Um, because we're at this point, verbal author, verbal offers of athletic aid are now permissible. Um, this is a time again, as we said, it was too early at the end of sophomore year. By this point, hopefully, you've started having the conversations. And um, am I still on? Okay. Um, sorry, my screen blanked out. So you're having these conversations. You have worked towards this point, built a relationship, have gotten um, some of the, the awkward conversations out of the way. Um, and again, have start, this is when you could otherwise in non-COVID times, start doing on-campus visits um, and in-person evaluations and visits. So um, hopefully we'll get back to those. Um, but right now, um, August 1st, prior to your junior year is when verbal offers of aid can be met. But again, if on August 1, you're not getting the exact scholarship offer you're, you're making that you were hoping for right now, more than ever, please be patient because coaches have really bad math problems and really hard riddles to work out, even with their current rosters right now. Yeah. And I just wanted to chime in on this piece, Jackie, because I know the question's mm -hmm. been asked um, yep. about, you know, kids that are committing currently. And when I get to the mm -hmm. survey, you'll see. Um, that during COVID, there, there are kids that are committing a lot are based on prior evaluations. Um, some are, recruit, are, are committing kids just from current video plus prior evaluations. Um, and, and one of the questions that, that came up that was sent in earlier was about how do we know if a, a school is really interested in our daughter? And, and you know, it's this, after this August 1st, when things start to speed up a little bit and communication is possible and uh, aid um, offers are possible and all the other things that you can do and it's open recruiting. Um, I think the thing to gauge it by is just, um, you know, if you've been really proactive and they've been pro and they've been proactive back and they've been responsive. If you don't hear from a college coach for a really long time, um, it's not a good sign that they're probably, you're probably towards the top of their list. I think that, um, you know, you need to, again, move on. If, if they're not showing interest back in you, that's a, that's an indicator. If it's a dream school that you've always wanted to go to, um, you know, give it one last college try, no pun intended, but I would say that, that if you get a little bit of radio silence or a little bit of pushback, um, you know, that that's probably a sign for you to move on or hopefully the coach will also be honest with you and just let you know that, that you're not in their, their top group that they're looking at. Um, so just again, there's no such thing as being uh, overly persistent in your own recruitment. You need to be once this kind of, this, this period speeds up here. Um, but again, I'll get to some of the statistics later. So if you're not hearing a lot from those coaches and other kids are committing to schools, um, don't panic or don't worry about what others are doing. Just pay attention to what's going on in your world with the schools you're communicating with. Um, and obviously get your coaches and um, the other people in your inner circle to help you kind of navigate through that. And keep lists, be really organized about the kind of communication you're having, pros and cons, what's important to you. All of those things are gonna be uh, things that weigh in your decision eventually. So, uh, you know, you don't wanna leave yourself just sort of hanging out there until the end and then you, then you will panic because you won't have all the information that you need to have and you'll feel uh, more stressed than you need to about your decision, which should be a really exciting decision for you once you make it. Oh yeah. Exciting. Enjoy the process right there. Enjoy the process, but keep on task, right? Some um, some questions that have come in, and, and uh, thank you, Amy, for, for sending those along. Um, right now, so IB classes, so the International Baccalaureate, I believe those are what IB means. Um, you've got to check with your high school. Those can be hit or miss. I know they're great classes. I know it's a neat um, degree, but if your high school hasn't gone through the, through the process of getting their IB program approved with the NCAA, it it just is another headache. So it's a good thing to check your core courses for that um, for those courses to show up 
on the high school list. It's very high school specific in that regard. Um, weighted course GPAs, nope. It's just um, weighted does not matter for the NCAA division one. It will with your admissions, um, but the NCAA, an A is an A, a B is a B, a C is a C, like even a B plus. Um, yeah, with, just, uh, with admissions based on the school you're applying to. And yes, yeah. again, um, when we, we talk about like know the difference for your admissions requirements and those things, this is something to know at this point, especially. So these are um, seniors in the world. Um, so yes, you're still applying to college. Your high school courses matter, as we've said uh, before, um, each year, it's an unfortunate thing. Um, well, it wound up for maybe for them or not, or because uh, at Washington, had a few folks that, um, that didn't quite um, meet their Ivy admissions contract and um, came and, and were looking really late at other possible schools. So um, again, especially Ivy's um, division three, they can also like your admissions might be conditioned based on certain course grades and stuff from your spring. Um, they, they really actually don't admit you. Um, please hear me when I say that, that that's not like a thing or like that they say, oh, you gave it a good try. No, like the admissions folks, there's no real waiver if you don't get admitted. Um, so if you're on an admissions contract, like be prepared to, to make those um, standards and those GPAs are gonna set forth. Again, if you're, we get back to taking the ACT or the SAT, the NCAA's um, eligibility code is 9999. That is a free course send. Um, please take advantage of sending your course, your SAT directly to your, the NCAA eligibility center. They will, it will automatically connect to your profile. It is free. When, if you don't do it at the time when you take the course, it is, an, and I think it's something like a $70 fee to get it, just an email. Really just take advantage of the free one um, and find the course, the, the number of the universities that you were thinking about. I think you get five per free test score for each time you take the SAT. Also, please, regardless of scholarship status, please fill out the FAFSA. Um, it is literally what it stands for is the free application of federal student aid. It's, it's free money um, that you may or may not qualify for. Um, it also is even if you don't believe um, that, that, that you are in a place that, that you might not get need-based aid, it's a good determinant possibly for university scholarships as well. So again, when, those, when, you, when you fill out your FAFSA, um, people in compliance talk with the financial aid office can talk with coaches about possibly what other institutional aid is available. Institutions will rarely be able to give, um, especially public universities, if you don't have um, an EFC, an estimated family contribution number that comes from a FAFSA on record with the university. So it's really just behooves you to do it. The new app that the um, the federal government, the, the Department of Education um, has developed um, is really good for this right now. Um, it will automatically pull your, your taxes um, and parents, this is something that if you're like itching to do something in terms of your, your daughter's recruitment, um, this is something that you can do right now. And then always the friendly reminder that test scores and transcripts, if you have them, uh, test scores, if you have them, definitely your transcripts, um, you have to send them to the college and to the eligibility center, um, they don't talk um, to each other. So you've got to send them both places and they have to be official. Just one last uh, question on academics for now. Yep. And we got about 20 minutes left and we have, uh, I think a little bit to cover still oh, is wow. on uh, running, what's that running? Yeah, running start classes, um, yeah. they hurt you. Um, I don't think they really do hurt you other than the fact if you get really ahead on credits, you could graduate early. <laughs> but you don't have to if your major is different, but it does help fulfill uh, prerequisites a lot of times that you, don't, um, that you don't have to redo once you get to college and you can get to your major quicker, you can get out of the prereq mode. Um, I think that's the most simple answer. They don't, they don't hurt you. We, uh, in my last couple of years at Washington had a player that came in that was almost in, she had a, an AA degree almost and thought, 
I already have my degree. So, you know, and she basically started, I think, taking graduate classes, but she also took more upper division classes earlier in her time. So um, running start doesn't really, it doesn't hurt you. Uh, and so we'll move on here, Jackie. Oh, your final thoughts. Yeah, final thoughts. Um, right. So those conversations we've been talking about, um, have the hard conversations about finances and what does that look like for you right now? Um, will you need a scholarship? Those things, being up front and, and getting those through so everyone's on the same page goes a long way um, to the stress level in the house through this process. Um, and we're all staying a lot of time in our houses right now. Um, and again, something that for me was starting to become uh, really sad was I was hearing these things on campus about um, year round soccer players. And again, I know the philosophy changes, but please avoid becoming or parents out there creating soccer zombies, soccer. I saw there's a few coaches out there. Really, um, the saddest thing recently, like in the last seven, eight years of my, my college um, employment was that, that not just in soccer, that, that student athletes were coming injured, no pat like burnt out because they were only playing their one sport. Um, and having identities outside of soccer, having a hobby and, and not just to fill out a cool admissions app um, is really important and something that um, should always be positively cultivated at this time. Um, and again, those are things that, uh, the, have your own passion for this, um, especially if you're going to play division one. It is a lot of time, energy and effort. Um, it, is, it is 20 hours a week um, minimum. Um, and then the, the time around that, um, that's something to talk with coaches about. What is the expectation? Is there film, is there weights? Is there other fitness that you can be doing or th that the team expected outside that 20 hours? Um, or is another experience um, playing a second sport um, or being, again, like we talked about sorority, again, creating soccer zombies is, is not, not great. And parents I, on the line right now or in the room, we need you to be adult allies. This is super, uh, super important. It's something that um, we, the parent behavior and like expectation to be able to talk with college coaches afterwards about playing time isn't going to happen. I'm just going to tell you right now, it doesn't bode well. That conversation, um, once, once you send your daughter off, um, is different. So just start getting used to that now, um, that, that playing time, uh, there's not a college coach I know that won't talk to you about the health and well-being of your daughter. Um, if you have concerns about that, um, those are things that you should always feel free. If you feel that your daughter is having struggling, um, those are things that, that to call the college coaches up about, but soccer anymore, no, you kind of get, get pushed out of the, the, the nest there. So again, those are things to remember and, and parents, please be positive um, about this process. Okay, for real, my real final thoughts, be patient, be patient, be patient. Um, and we've talked about it already. The college coaches right now are, are going through so much. The rules are changing on them when they're playing games, if they're playing games, um, are their administration going to fund um, fifth years? Is the NCAA gonna allow waivers for scholarship limits that we've already talked about? Those things are all up in the air. Um, injuries, transfers, all this is such in, in, in flux. That um, and that all cascades down into recruiting. So they're likely taking care of the, and this is what you want out of your college coaches, right? Taking care of their current players before they start recruiting the next ones. Um, so again, what's most important for you right now is take care of you um, so that you can be the happiest, healthiest, um, best soccer player to engage in this process as well. Awesome. Yeah, so, awesome, Jackie. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I was going to share some of the results from uh, a survey that I did. And when I pulled these up, there was about 200 and something coach, 290 something that had answered. Uh, when I looked again today, we had more, we were up towards uh, over 300 college coaches of all divisions had answered the questions. So I asked the following, the recruiting landscape, and this is all very COVID specific, so worth listening to is that will your budget allow you to attend recruiting events in 2021? 
Here you say that their budget, yes, 90% of them said yes, 10% said no. So coaches, if they are allowed out, are still planning to come to events. And we've already in the GA tried to do a good job, obviously, of pivoting our events to make sure that coaches could be there. And then uh, between January and July, assuming that the NC2A dead period allows, how many events are you budgeted to attend? So uh, you see it's pretty even across the board, a little bit more than 30% said one to three, three to five, five or more events. So um, coaches are itching to get out there to watch you live because it is their first preference of what they uh, want to do and how they want to see you in your environment. Um, and then how coaches plan to recruit. And I asked the question, uh, will you or are you committing players strictly from video evaluation? So uh, here's an answer that I thought was extremely interesting. 45% uh, ish said yes, 55% uh, said no. And on this question, we left a bubble box open just for comments. And a lot of them are saying, in addition to having seen them live, um, but again, there were many of them. And I think there's more yeses on here than you would guess because nobody knew that COVID was gonna last this long. And so coaches are starting to feel as though video is obviously uh, a great way to recruit. Um, our, in the GA, our partnership with Instat uh, is a requirement that all uh, the games and the league games that are going on right now get uploaded by Monday night. Um, players have access to those if you want. You probably, um, some of you are using it already. Some of you have access to other platforms that your club uses to be able to do your own highlight videos. Um, but this is a great way for you and your club coaches to be able to uh, get information out to, to the colleges. So video is huge. Um, our, our, again, our partnership with Instat and Veo Camera, or whatever videotaping you are doing, um, making sure that, that your club uh, is doing a good job of listening to sort of the specs of what is needed because they understand what college coaches are looking for as far as the view, the angle, being able to see your jersey, um, you know, just knowing all of that is very, very important for your recruitment from video. Um, and then the classes that college coaches are recruiting, I think you'll be fairly surprised to know that close to 70% are still recruiting for the 2021 class. Uh, this is unique in that um, right now, uh, not every conference in Division I soccer is playing and most of the other divisions are not playing is that uh, what's happening is if they have a spring season, there are probably players sitting around on already semi-big rosters that would be fifth years next year that want to stay around for a sixth year of eligibility. And this is causing a huge headache, one for colleges and two for you guys as recruits to figure out where there's gonna be room for you. When Jackie talks about, and I don't know we had that many 21s on this call, um, I did have a club coach, uh, one of the academy directors actually tell me that he had a uh, U19 player quit because she just didn't feel like there was going to be a place for her, which is sad, um, because I think there will be. Uh, what's going to happen in the spring, in my opinion, is that college coaches will play their spring season in whatever format that ends up being, fingers crossed, um, for the kind of weird championship in the spring. And then at the end of that year, there's many coaches that are going to have to have the difficult conversation with fifth year seniors to say, because it is at a college coach's discretion to say, we have freshmen that are committed. We signed them to their NLIs in November. They're coming in. We can't have a roster of 56 kids and, or we don't have scholarship money for you. Um, if you have eligibility and you want to transfer and go somewhere else, that's fine. If they were to tell them that now, that would cause as, as much as that should be an honest conversation to have, it's difficult because of team dynamics. These are players who want to play in the spring, think they're going to be a part for the next two seasons. Um, so it just creates, you know, it could create a, you know, chemistry problem within the team. Um, it's just a difficult conversation to have. And plus they should be able to have a spring. You know, everyone is really being patient right now and trying to get this year in, but for college coaches, just understanding that they're in a tough position with this class um, to figure out what their rosters are going to look like in the fall of 21. Uh, are you evaluating for the year 22? Over 90% and 23. Some people have started already evaluating and some have not. That's a, a little more than I would have thought, but go for it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we had some open-ended questions here and uh, was what is the best way for you to see and evaluate players currently? And in red, oops, in tricky trigger finger here I've got, 
in red, you'll see game film live stream and recorded is was the most popular answer. So in the Girls Academy, and I know there's some clubs that live stream off of their Instagram or off their Facebook page or uh, those things for league games. Uh, when we have our events, we're working on being able to live stream those, uh, particularly if, if um, you know, it's difficult for college coaches to travel, even if they are able to be there in person, some won't be. So we're working to um, solidify that as a platform for us. And then you'll see the other things listed there that are important. Game highlights or specific game segments, game statistics, uh, watching games in, per in person, local conference games. So the league games are really important. Um, coach communication references uh, and ID camps and clinics, when those can start to happen again, people don't know, but you know, those are important to college coaches when they do start to occur again. Obviously the tournaments and showcases, uh, phone calls and Zoom. Some people are doing, you know, Zoom tours of the campus. So if you haven't been able to be on a campus, you know, if I were to ask coaches three months ago, if they would commit someone without them ever being on campus, they would have said no. Um, and during the dead period, I do know of kids who have gone on campuses and two campuses, but not met the coaches or seen them. They've just done their own tour uh, and looked around the area if they're not from there. So they get familiar with it. Um, attending training sessions, online recruiting websites, and then past evaluations are going to be key. But game film and live stream recorded is something in the GA that we're taking really seriously. And um, because of this survey, trying to make sure it happens for our players. <clears throat> and then what can the Girls Academy and our clubs do better to assist you with recruiting during this fall winter or until the NCAA Division I dead period ends? And you'll see there in red, information on players. So this is for club coaches out there and for the players that are on the call, if your club coach isn't here or your academy director is to talk to them about, make sure on your profiles and that your coaches know or your college coordinator for your club knows uh, your interest level, the major that you intend, location of the college, um, you know, things like that. And then obviously easy accessible video with instructions that is good quality, can see the numbers on the jersey, put locations and times of games on social media, which we've done already. So we make sure that your, your league schedules are out there. Make sure you're reposting and retweeting and all that kind of stuff. You guys have done a good job with that so far. Um, we are going to start to send pretty regularly um, an update for upcoming events. So we're gonna send like a, a, a bi-monthly newsletter to college coaches that has the schedule. We don't wanna do it too often because in case, especially during COVID, we've had a lot of game changes and we don't wanna to have to go back and update um, but we will put the caveat on there that these are subject to last minute being able to check that the roster or the schedule is still a go because we have had a, a couple of different cancellations, but we're going to make sure that we blast out to all the college coaches, um, as well as the U.S. Soccer Talent ID Scouts who were already in the fold with us and attending our showcases, um, attending our events and our technology as it was in the DA is linked to the U.S. Soccer Talent ID so they are able to track everyone in our league. Um, so these are some of the other things you can see and read on there as far as responses. And then I will just say, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick and open it up here for a second. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go, a lot of you were very uh, kind in taking the time to send in questions uh, mm -hmm. beforehand. And one of the things that was asked was specific to the GA and what we're doing specifically to make sure that our league is one that is competitive with the other competitive platforms out there. And so for us, it's been really important again to talk about just the, the high standard um, of play and having standards and making sure that we have meaningful competition as we build this league out. Uh, again, it's been really difficult during COVID to make sure that uh, we do it safely. And, and that's been obviously my biggest priority as the commissioner, that getting the league off the ground, getting you all registered. Kudos to your admins, kudos to our director of ops, Amber Klimek, for getting you guys back on the field. Um, I know some of you are still in interesting circumstances where you're having a hard time uh, getting out and getting contact practice and all that, but just keep doing things the right way so it continues to move forward. And when I say that about soccer, I mean it about uh, in life too. So just be diligent in the way you go about life so we can keep soccer, um, soccer going the right direction. Um, other things as far as the GA is concerned that is important to us is you guys all have a way to communicate through your, uh, your team reps, your uh, club reps, as well as your conference reps on our player led board. Uh, these players have been put into um, a great 
position of leadership, the thing that makes this league unique is one, it's only for girls and it's girls competitive soccer that we are going to work very hard to make sure that you um, understand that uh, in the game of soccer, that there are all kinds of things you can be through the game, all kinds of things you can do, all kinds of networking you can do. And I will say as a 34 year plus college coach, one of the things I noticed that uh, players came in a little bit ill-equipped with as college players, um, on the field and off the field, but just understanding um, the self-awareness in their own empowerment. I think Jackie mentioned it earlier that you don't need to be a captain to be a leader and how you lead yourself um, starts, mm -hmm. starts now for all of you. And to be able to put you in a position where we're giving you things that are educational like tonight, we will be doing programming with you and we'll be listening to um, the players that you voted in to represent you to ask, um, to tell us what it is you think is meaningful in your experience. I know when I was a player, I was never really asked what I thought. Um, and so I, it's just important for you all to have a, a say in your pathway. Um, again, I already mentioned that um, our collaboration with college coaches, I was flattered to be honest and extremely pleased with the number of college coaches that filled out the survey that I sent out. Um, and because I know for a fact that that does not happen very often that you get that high of a percentage of return. Uh, and so that was that was great, but we're doing everything we can to make sure one that the events are going to be outstanding that talent ID is there. Um, and that we're working hard on all of our partnerships to be meaningful um, for the players based on things we've seen. Um, let's see, there's some other questions. I think Jackie's uh, uh, presentation covered so many of the questions that came in. Um, I tried to answer a few of these as we were going. Um, oh, good. Yeah, um, just within kind of where you were talking about it, the money and what's gonna happen, nobody knows, to be uh -huh. honest, is, is college coaches are just, uh, all the ones I talk to on a daily basis are, it's literally a day-to-day -day thing. And, and you see some of the conferences that are, are up and playing. I don't think there's one of the conferences in division one that's playing that hasn't had a setback as far as a delay or a canceled game because of COVID, just like you're doing in your club. And this is gonna be something that everyone continues to navigate. What the spring season looks like is going to continue to be interesting. Um, for kids that are entering college in 2021, just cross your fingers that you're gonna be able to live in a dorm and go to class in person um, and have a college experience that doesn't leave you sort of hanging out there. A team is a great thing to be a part of, so that'll help, but it's still a, a unique situation right now for all of you. Um, let's see, somebody asked the specific question of what coaches look for in specific players. And I think that is an outstanding question for you to ask in writing or when you talk to a coach. If you have your colleges down to a certain number of schools and you're, uh, you know, you play in the six and you've watched their school and you know how they play, you know what a six looks like on their team. Um, you can talk soccer, college coaches love that. If you talk the game with them and you say things like, do you really hold your six or is the six a box to box player? Do you want that person to be more of a, a defensive type player? Do they have to be good in possession as well as be um, a tough tackler, a good defender, whatever it is. Um, have soccer conversations with college coaches. They love that. They also love to know that you know what their team is like. Um, that mm -hmm. you're, you don't say that I think I could really play for you and you've never watched them. Um, that's a, a common mistake again, uh, amongst recruits. So be very careful about that. Um, let's see, what else? There's a couple in here. Is there still a chance to get on a team as a walk-on? How does that process work? It's different at every school. Uh, back in the day when, again, COVID is going to make rosters most likely larger than people want them to be, especially in women's soccer. Um, I think what you're going to see in the spring is a whole bunch of players fall into the transfer portal because it's just going to be an interesting time because of fifth and sixth year seniors and the way the NC2A has given eligibility back. Um, but the question of being a, a recruited walk-on I addressed earlier is like, are you guaranteed a spot? Or I'm just coming to school there. I may or may not play, but can I have a, you know, can I have a tryout, so to speak? And um, most coaches, because soccer is a fall sport, will say that um, in the spring, you can try out, wait till the fall season comes. And when we lose our seniors, you can come out in the spring and we'll give you a trial um, or just put you on the roster for a spring mm -hmm. and at the end of spring, tell you whether you come back in the fall or not. It's different for every college coach, but it's worth asking the question if that's really the school you want to go to and you feel confident that that's a place where you have a chance of making the team. Um, let's see. Leslie, can I hop in too? Yeah. For a I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to plug something else. If you've got a dream school and it, it doesn't work out for you, um, soccer wise to, to wear the Jersey, there are plenty of opportunities in every athletic department 
for you to find what you want your future career to be in that athletic department and still be involved in sports. Um, I made a career out of being in, in, in college athletics. If you are in accounting, they do money. If you want to do marketing, if you want to do visuals, if you're doing um, athletic training, you can still be part of sport at your university. It doesn't always have to be in the Jersey. So just remember like um, being a managed student manager is also a viable thing. Um, so those, if you have your dream school set out and it doesn't work with you in playing, don't think that, that, that soccer or your athletics identity that needs to be done that those are things that you can explore. And I'll tell you every athletic department will love student workers. Yeah, we are, we're at the 92 minute mark right now, um, but I'm gonna keep answering a couple more questions. Um, and then what I will also do, because a lot of people, I'm gonna go through the questions again that people emailed in with their registration. Um, and I will be able to put those out um, in the GA in the next week or so, so you can have answers in addition to the recording of this call. Um, one of the college advisor asked about uh, somebody on here is a, the college advisory program director for their club that the high percentage 85 to 90 percent of their players tend to go to school or want to go to school locally or within the region. Um, are we doing anything about a regional regional event so every conference, which is the setup of the GA will be able to do their own regionalized events. Um, as well as uh, every conference will have a, a talent ID event that is attached to their conference. So um, we understand that this is clearly something that um, speaks to uh, what is needed for our players. So um, that's something that is definitely being addressed. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to mention just based on um, how quickly and how sort of judiciously we had to put together this league. And again, kudos again to, to everyone that, that was able to, to be a part of getting this league launched is that our platform through registration through Got Soccer is still a little bit of a work in progress in that there are things on there that we know are a little bit glitchy still, but everything is getting very close to being the way we want it as far as the tables, the rosters, the team pages, the, the things that will give college coaches a place to go to understand when events are, when games are, and then to be able to click on your roster, your team, and see your stats, and everything will be, be updated, um, you know, almost to perfection here in the next couple of weeks. I can tell you there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's not an excuse by any means, but I will say that uh, MLS Next on the boys' side also uses Got Soccer, and they came in about the same time we did, so that's probably close to 20-something thousand players that needed to get registered and approved in a very, very short period of time. Um, so we appreciate everyone's patience. Everyone's been outstanding. We're just happy to get you guys out and playing safely again. Um, let's see, someone asked about spring games, college coaches, hopefully d January one is the, the, for D one schools. That's the day they can get out. Keep your fingers crossed. Um, somebody asked this question. I thought it was good that their daughter was down to her top five schools. And uh, she has weekly calls with these schools and she feels like she's ready to commit. It doesn't say what age she is. So my guess if she's talking to people, she's a junior or above. Um, to me, that's a, yeah, that, to me, that's a comfort level is if you feel like those are your top five schools, you have pros and cons, you feel comfortable with all of them. You've developed a relationship with the coaches. Uh, you're to the point where, you know, when you decide you're not going to the next morning, wake up and go, what have I done? Um, I, I don't think there's any reason not to think that you could commit. If you haven't been on the campus, um, you know, that's something that, that is, is the one sticking point that sometimes uh, is the one that either coaches or players kind of get hung up on. But if you've done a Zoom, um, a, a Zoom tour and or you've been in and around that part of the country before and at least you know what it's like. Um, I, like I said, I think college coaches three months ago would like, I would never recruit a kid that didn't come on campus. And then COVID lingering has been like, well, <laughs> never say never. So, cause there are people committing kids now that three months ago, didn't think they would be in that boat and they're doing it because they know that that's kind of what's, what's happening. And we don't know how long this is going to last and how long this environment will be. So I certainly think if you're, you're ready to commit and you feel good about it, that, um, and you've done your work, then kudos to you for having your top five and, and being that, um, you know, that proactive. Um, let's see, somebody asked about uh, California and guest playing with other, other, other clubs. Um, I know in Southern California in particular, because Las Vegas is open and Arizona is open that our league games have moved 
Uh, the conference did a great job of coming up with a schedule to be able to go to Arizona and play league games. I know Washington has been in the same boat. It's, it's primarily been out West, Washington, Northern California, went to Utah and played in an unsanctioned tournament, but they got some games in. Um, and we're just hopeful that it continues to move forward based on what their schedules are. But we're, I mean, you guys, kids and players out there, what you have to understand, there's a lot of adults working really, really hard um, to make sure that, that, that you have the opportunity to play. Somebody asked the question about a database for, for guest players. Um, that's not a bad idea. And we can certainly look at that as a way to get you out and playing on teams. But then again, we have to stay within the rules of whatever your quarantine rules are in your county, in your state, because you don't want your whole club to get shut down because you did something um, that wasn't within the COVID protocol of the government. So um, things to think about. Uh, let's see, let's zip through a few more of these. We still have 728 people hanging on every word I'm saying. <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get a couple more in here. Uh, someone said, it's obvious teams will fill up. So how can we speed up the process? Um, that goes against what Jackie said as far as patience, but it's not speeding the process up. It's the, if you really know where you want to go, is the proactiveness of what you're allowed to do when you're allowed to do it, do it. So, um, you know, just get, go back, look at the slide deck from this, this um, presentation which we'll make available in addition to the recording. We have another one of Jackie's one sheeters that has the information on it and just make a list of what you should be doing when so you stay caught up. Um, and again, your, your people in your inner circle, your support system within soccer and academics are the people that need to be helping you um, navigate this as well. So lean on your college uh, directors in your club, your club coach, uh, et cetera. Um, Can I answer, I forgot to do my, sh my little talk about camps. Because I camp realized talk. camps were going on. So the ID camps on college campuses in in times when we you can get back to there or there are colleges that are open for camps. That is an excellent time to get seen, to get a feel for coaches, be in sessions with them. Um, so I'm a big proponent of, and possibly staying in dorms that you might be living in at that college. So for me, I think um, the the camps are good. You've got to ask a few questions. One, be sure that the head coach and the assistant coach are going to be there. There are very many times where some of these camps are run by players or by guest club coaches in the area and that the head coach just makes a token appearance and you've paid all that money not to go. Be sure that you get confirmation that the coaching staff that will be making decisions on scholarships and roster spots will be participating in that camp. So that's, that's my thing on camps, but I think camps, you can get a good feel um, for possibly current players and, and, and be involved with them. Um, and it's a good way to see campus on a different time and place. So yeah. That's, yeah, that's my show camp. That's great. And one of the things I would say about video also is videotaping your training sessions and having your coaches upload those um, to Instat or having those available uh, for college coaches is great. Even if you're, I wouldn't say all of the socially distanced practices, but um, anything that can kind of show just, you know, mm -hmm. your, your capabilities in some way, shape or form at training is, is positive. Uh, our league does require and again, whether Instat is the club's platform or not, everyone is getting Instat as part of our partnership with them. Um, you know, some have more of the bells and whistles of uh, analysis, but some use other platforms for the analysis. But every game video that's played on the weekend is supposed to be uploaded by Monday nights to Instat. So if you're, you know, not already doing that, and then players should have access to that as well. So get with your academy directors and make sure that they understand that 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 is um, it. It's every college coach will tell you it's invaluable. It is a game changer for your recruitment during this time. So uh, please, please, please take advantage of it. Somebody asked something about multi-sport athletes. Um, yep. If you're a multi-sport athlete, kudos to you for being able to balance that. Um, and, and again, you know, this group that put this, it, it's not just about multi-sport athletes, but this group that put this league together, the GA, they looked at all the awesome things that were, were part of the development academy with U.S. soccer and changed the two things that were a huge sticking point for most of the academy directors, which were high school soccer and uh, the substitution rule. So those have changed, um, but the standards and everything else um, we're continuing to work on and morph. But if you're a multi-sport uh, uh, multi athlete, um, good for you. Um, use it as a selling point for who you are. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of colleges out there. Would love to have you. Never mind. It's it's also good for your soccer to be able to 
um, participate in other sports as, as well as your mental health. I think when Jackie talks about the burnout thing, um, the high school thing, I've gotten a lot, I've had a lot of discussions with uh, club coaches about high school. Now that high school seasons have been shifted around. Some of you have made, may have opted out of high school this year, sadly, because it is an option for you and you wanted to play your junior or senior year. Some of you are going to play high school and miss some of your club. Some high school associations are giving concessions on the high school rule and letting you play both at the same time in some format. And we're working on that this week uh, with a couple of different associations to make sure that that makes sense. And the only thing I would add there for coaches and for players and parents is if you are doing both, uh, be sensible about it and uh, sensible about it is that your physical well-being, especially coming out of COVID, um, you're going to be at sort of a, a vulnerable phase in your playing as far as injury prevention and all that's concerned. So your coaches in your club with the standards that we have, you have, uh, you know, outstanding coaches that are responsible for you. They should be able to look at your playing schedule and know when and when you shouldn't be playing and when and where, when you should be resting so and recovering. So make sure that you're smart about that if you play both. Um, still 668 people, uh, but, but, but I'm, I really am gonna go back to all the questions that came in, but I wanna give kudos to Jackie Minarski who um, really knocked it out of the park with her presentation and I think answered 95% of the press uh, questions that came in ahead of time. Um, Amy Griffin is the vice president on the board of directors of the Girls Academy and is also uh, the academy director for the OL Reign here in Washington and um, came on at the last minute, thank the Lord, because I think, and, and she's a good typist, I'm aware of this. She's been really killing it in the chat or the question and answer room, hopefully. So uh, people are still raising their hand and asking questions. We'll make sure that we get this recording out ASAP so that the clubs that missed it can use it. Um, we really wanted to be able to provide this uh, to the league because we know there's a high level of stress out there. But the other thing we know, there's a high level achievement in our league. We have some of the best players in the country playing in the GA. Um, I am so appreciative of your support of me and of this league that um, I, I, I just, every day I wake up excited to help make an impact for you. Uh, lean on your team club and conference reps in the advisory panel to get your voice out there if there's things that you wanna know about. Um, we're going to, we're, you know, crossing our fingers to get our events out of the shoot here, uh, you know, as soon as we possibly can. They're on the calendar. We're planning for them. We're trying to figure out which teams um, uh, can make it to the, the two optional ones. And then, you know, hopeful that our mandatory events, again, that COVID has gone bye-bye and we're able to um, knock it out of the, the park when we all can be together again and show up and, and watch you play in person. So, um, I can't imagine that I left too much out, but, <laughs> um, but I think uh, I, I, this is a good question. I like this one. I don't know if Amy answered this one. It's a good one. I, I love looking at the questions. Marketing yourself I, if you're an injured player is. Yeah. Did you answer that one? Amy? No, but no. I'm. I'm yeah. So hear marketing your yourself if you're an injured player and you have to go back a little ways to find video of yourself is. You know, you need to have people in your corner speaking on your behalf. Um, the player. You know what you've done in your rehab, where you are now when you get back to games, because I've seen dozens of kids already um, that have come off injury that are now playing and that aren't playing, but I know they're training and are crushing it. Um, yeah. And so you just have to be really forthright and brag about yourself. And I will say this, um, as the Girls Academy League <laughs> commissioner and knowing what players that are in your shoes are like is that as girls in particular, you need to in the um, most professional and most proactive and most, um, you know, uh, I think palatable way, learn to brag about yourself, um, you know, in a way that is confident, in a way that paints a true picture of yourself, that's self-aware, um, that, that makes it, makes college coaches understand that you know where you fit in um, realistically uh, and, and, and have that self-awareness. So if you need someone to sit down with you and really that you trust that will have the hard conversation with you, or at least the honest conversation with you about where you stand and, and where you are right now. Those are the people that are going to be in your corner and, um, and sending, you know, sending good vibes to college coaches where they think you can play. Um, trust people that have seen those teams play. Trust people that know what that college program is like, know what the culture on that team is like. Uh, make sure that if you are getting ready to commit that you've on a Zoom had a chance to um, have conversations with, with players on, on their team that, um, you know, that, that 
you can ask questions of or that you know um, have lived it. So, you know, when the recruiting becomes open, um, yeah, <laughs> Jackie just made a face. Did I say something illegal? No. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, those are, say whatever would, you want. those are things that I would say are really, really, really mm -hmm. important. Um, yeah. Be confident, at sell, you know, sell yourself, think about your social media, brand yourself in a way that's true to who you are, be genuine, be real. Um, but don't, don't hide your light beneath the bushel either. Get out there and, um, you know, make sure that you, you're, you're proactive in your own, uh, your own recruitment. And I, I, I know there'll be great things for you. Weigh all your different pathways that are possible for you. Don't limit yourself at all. And you'll find the place that's great for you. I'm confident. And this isn't the last time we're going to, um, help you with this college search thing. It's going to be, you know, ongoing education and, and we're all here for you. So, um, again, I just wanted to say thanks to our scribe and question answer, Amy <laughs> Griffin. Kudos to my friend, Jackie Minarski, uh, the expert. And it's been uh, happy to be, in, I've been really happy to be in front of you all tonight. And I cannot wait to see you guys all out on the field. So thanks. Good night, everyone. Night, everybody. <laughs>